So now we're going to approach <clears throat> an important legacy in later times, controversial legacy of um, Monroe and what is known as the Mon Monroe Doctrine. Now, <clears throat> what I don't have here in this um, PowerPoint is that in part what set it off was uh, a kind of um, issue for the United States in dealing with Russia on, in the far west. <clears throat> And and then the main one that kind of falls through is these Latin American revolutions that were taking place. And so the question is then what what does this all mean in terms of <clears throat> articulating what we would call the Monroe Doctrine? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, in the 1820s, Latin American revolutions led uh, the U.S. to focusing on the southern form, uh, um, a, a, a southern foreign policy. Okay, so this is something that I want to remind us all right now, that this hemisphere, right, we share with not just Canada and not just Mexico, but Central and South America. And <clears throat> this is something that I think um, that many American citizens don't necessarily think much about, especially those who are not from uh, Mexico or anywhere in Central or South America. But this is going to be the beginning of the U.S. playing a role within the hemisphere or assuming the right to be... Um, a leader in this hemisphere and <clears throat> the controversy of that will will come in respects to our relationship to south of the border in which most of us are not really well aware of um but i'll focus a little bit more on that a little bit later so um in 1815 the u.s proclaimed neutrality and yet we did aid some of the the rebels okay um President Monroe in 1822 made the U.S. the first country to recognize um, La Plata, Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico. Now, a year later, um, this work, which is primarily the, the work of Adams, okay, remember that, <clears throat> um, quote, uh, he sa it states, the American continents are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. Our policy in regard to Europe is not to interfere in the internal concerns of any of its powers. Um, and so <clears throat> the, the, the idea was, is, is the United States was really helping secure the idea that big superpowers from Europe are not going to be players in this hemisphere. And um, henceforth, we encourage the independence of these uh, other nations to get, for instance, Spain out, out, <laughs> go out, leave. Okay. Um, now, first of all, I want to make state this. This is kind of a declaration like the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence, remember, we weren't independent. It's a declaration that only means something if we were going to actually become independent. We could, we could actually fight and get that independence, which we did. To tell European powers, oh, you know, you, you can't come over on this side and get involved anymore. Um, that really didn't mean a whole lot in, in the fact that I mean, European powers could simply say, well, uh, I disagree. And, um, you know, but what it did say is that there will be conflict, that we're saying that we're not going to allow this. And so, um, you know, is, it's, it's sort of a peaceful threat that maybe European powers feared or could care less about, um, if you see what I'm saying. Okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, that was set into motion, but over the long term, uh, um, I just kind of want to point out, uh, well, first, it was an expression of growing U.S. nationalism, okay, and establishing this idea of U.S. hegemony in this Western hemisphere, but this policy 
is going to be more controversial and that it didn't just say, oh, we're justified in pushing out foreign intervention from European powers. Later now, you could argue that we, um, if China tried to set up bases in Latin America, the Monroe Doctrine would be uh, invoked to say, no, we've, we set a long precedent that this is our hemisphere and that we are going to be deal very strongly uh, uh, um, in this regards. Okay, so um, it kind of went beyond just Europe. In other words, any world power outside uh, of this hemisphere, okay, hands off. Now, what this did though, is it also set, set this precedent that the United States has a right to intervene in Latin America when it feels that its interests are at stake. And so, um, you know, in the Cold War, we overthrew many governments, sometimes democracies, and installed very brutal dictatorships and um, did some of our most controversial foreign policy um, acts. Um, I mean, really controversial, like uh, torture camps and so forth that were set up by military dictatorships that were in fear of a communist revolution. And so just to kind of give the argument, the idea was that um, any kind of, in, in, in a time period in foreign policy where it was the U.S. competing against the Soviet Union and then, by extension, communist China, that even if they didn't directly aid anybody in Latin America, a communist revolution would be a kind of open door, like an invitation for a foothold of Soviet influence in this region. And so the U.S. foreign policy was to commit and not, I mean, by any means necessary, not allow that to happen. And so that's what I mean by the controversial rule of Monroe, Monroe Doctrine. So now for people who study Latin America and for Latin American uh, uh, nationalists, people who are nationalists in, in Chile and elsewhere, um, we go all the way back to this time as a center of controversy over basically them saying, we have a right to do what we want and you as the United States don't have a right to tell us what to do. And we're seeing more and more assertion of, of independence and, and of leaders actually um, fighting against uh, our dominance in Latin America especially since Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, uh, the late um, president slash dictator, however you want to call him. Um, and, and so, I, you know, the reason why I just wanted to kind of go on this long talk about this is because I wanted to just discuss the legacy also of this very important doctrine. Some could argue it's kept our interests very secured and safe. In Latin America, many elites have felt it has also helped secure their interests, but it is very controversial in Latin America, and I just want to remind uh, my students that uh, our role in Latin America is has been very thorough for a long time, and it's not on the radar of most um, citizens of the United States to even follow or look at, and you should, regardless of what your opinion is on the, the ethics or the morals or you know, all those kind of things there. Okay, so that's all I'll say about uh, that for now. Um, all right, so moving on. Um, we come to the end of the presidency for Monroe and we get into um, uh, basically after 1816, the Federalist Party offered no presidential uh, candidate and um, we ended up uh, having a, a presidential race that was going to be very complicated. And we're going to have what's called the corrupt bargain. And essentially, um, I'll just play a little bit of this clip right here, and I'll go back and discuss this a little bit more. So um, here's a little discussion of what took place. Welcome to John Quincy Adams' President and the Corrupt Bargain Study Guide. Four candidates ran for president in the election of 1824. Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, and William Crawford. The results of this election were different than we'd had in any previous election. 
The popular vote are the actual votes received from the people. The electoral vote goes to whoever gets the most votes in each state. And the electoral votes are the combination of the number of representatives and the number of senators each state has. In the election of 1824, Andrew Jackson won both the popular and the electoral votes. John Quincy Adams came in second. Henry Clay, a very low third, and William Crawford ran under him for fourth. Now, you would think that this would mean that Andrew Jackson won the presidency. Not so. In order to win the election, the candidate must receive a majority, and a majority is one more than 50%. In this case, Jackson won a plurality. He did get the most votes but he did not get a majority of the votes. In that situation, the U.S. House of Representatives is left with the job of voting to determine who will be the next president. Henry Clay was Speaker of the House. That means he was the leader of the House of Representatives. Because of this, he was immediately eliminated from the running for president when the vote went to the House of Representatives. So he chose the candidate that had the closest ideology to him, and that was John Quincy Adams. He put his support and he put the power of his position as Speaker of the House behind John Quincy Adams. Jackson accused Clay of using his influence to help John Quincy Adams win the election. Okay. <coughs> And so um, that's pretty much how it went down. Um, John Quincy Adams uh, uh, goes to running for president and he wins because um, Henry Clay picked him. That's ultimately what happened. And it's going to be a very contentious um, presidency. I will kind of, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the next lecture.